Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Angeline Burks, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's webinar, which is Solutions for Perimeter Zoning with Underfloor Systems. We, uh, we have three presenters today. Our first presenter is Cam Regier, and he's joining us from our Winnipeg office. Cam is an application specialist at Price um, and has been with our team for four years focusing on displacement and underfloor technologies. And he also recently became the team leader for application support on our air distribution products. Um, in addition to providing design guidance and application support for projects across North America, Cam is also uh, actively involved in testing products and solutions at Price Research Center North and in product development. Second to present will be Dennis Sikama. Dennis Sikama uh, has over 25 years experience in the air distribution industry um, and has been a past committee member on a number of AHRI and ASHRAE committees. Um, in his experience in the industry, he's occupied a number of roles, of roles including applications engineering, product management, and more recently technical sales. As uh, Dennis has been with Price for t around 10 years now, and as the Director of Technical Sales, he oversees our training programs, among other responsibilities. Uh, closing out today's presentation will be Jerry Sipes. He is the Vice President of Engineering at Price, and he earned his PhD at Kansas State University. Jerry has 20 years of experience in the industry, um, and during that time has uh, participated in a number of different industry organizations and committees. The two most relevant to today's presentation are that he is the current chairman of the certification standard for chilled beams at AHR, AHRI, and is also the current chair for ASHRAE Standard 200 on the testing method for chilled beams. And with that, I would like to go ahead and pass the presentation over to Cam to get us started. Okay, thank you, Angeline, and welcome, everyone. So I'm going to start off with uh, a review of Underfloor. We're going to start with a, a very short review of the Underfloor technology, um, go into some of the design considerations specific to perimeter systems, and then we're going to run through the various different applications and systems that can be applied for an, an Underfloor perimeter system. And then we're going to finish off with uh, a little bit of the engineering support and the product offering. So for more information, we actually have a variety of different webinars available on our Price website. And the most pertinent one here is going to be our UFAD Introduction to Benefits and System Design, which is available at the link that you see on your screen and in the webinar. Uh, this this uh, presentation that we're going to be doing today is going to gloss over a lot of these concepts. So if you need any background information, this webinar will be uh, useful to you. So as a quick overview, we're going to talk quickly about mixing ventilation, and this is what our typical air distribution systems uh, in most buildings use and have used for decades. So we provide typically from an overhead diffuser uh, using 55 degrees or 13 degrees supply air. Um, and the goal here is, is mixing the entire space using these high velocity outlets. And you can see from the image there that the zone is going to be entirely mixed. Uh, the biggest contrast with this type of system to uh, an underfloor system is the much higher static pressures required to get that velocity and impart the momentum on the air entering the room, um, which of course requires a higher fan brake horsepower. So there's some energy considerations there. Now contrasting that is, is our underfloor air distribution system where we supply air to a plenum beneath the floor, and our diffusers are located right in the floor. Our supply temperature, as you can see, or our discharge temperature from the outlets is significantly warmer, and the main uh, room dynamic difference here is that we're seeing stratification, so the cool supply air is provided at the low level of the room, and then warm air and contaminants are stratified up at the higher level, meaning our our occupied zone is more comfortable and also more, uh, more clean as far as air quality goes. So the basic principle of the underfloor system is that we have a raised floor system and all of our building services like uh, ductwork, mechanical equipment, even piping, um, voice and data cabling, all that kinds of stuff goes underneath the floor system. 
And the whole system is actually, or the whole flooring is actually supported on these pedestals on, on typically two by two uh, intervals. So we've got these floor tiles that sit on top of the pedestals, making a cavity underneath the floor to provide air, as well as, as you can see in the picture there, cable trays, piping, ductwork, and everything required for a mechanical and electrical, electrical system. Now the main benefit of the underfloor system is the flexibility and the reduced cost of churn. Now churn is a, a term used to describe the rate at which people are moved around a building. So when offices move, when desks move, and furniture layout changes, that is churn. And it happens quite often in a typical office building. And when you have to move ductwork and you have to rebalance diffusers and redo control layouts, it can be expensive and often uh, it, it becomes cost prohibitive. Now with the raised floor system, since each outlet is not ducted, the control layouts are much larger zones, we can do these uh, reconfigurations much easier with an underfloor system. So that's a quick overview of the underfloor system as a whole, and now we're going to move into the actual design considerations to do with a perimeter system. So the important design factors for a perimeter system, the, the most important is going to be your actual perimeter conditions. So this is going to be things like your climate, your exposure, uh, the solar angle, windows, shading, anything to do with the actual perimeter of your building and the actual construction and siting and that type of thing. The next most important is going to be your plenum design and the actual layout of the ducting within that plenum. And finally, we're going to go through some of the diffuser design and different types of mechanical equipment that can be used afterwards. So in this plenum design section, we're going to kind of follow an evolution from the earliest and the simplest uh, plenum design up to the, uh, the most more, more complicated, perhaps more costly, but most effective system. And we'll kind of compare and contrast the differences. So starting off with, this was the simplest design was used uh, primarily or, or has been used extensively, is where we have a common plenum where the air handler or the rooftop unit basically discharges right into the underfloor plenum, typically from about the middle of the floor plate, and it's just discharging air in all directions towards the exterior. And what you can see from the figure there is the air is discharged maybe at 60 degrees from the air handler and it gains heat as it travels across the slab. Now it's gaining heat because in a typical building or multi-story building, that slab below is forming the ceiling for your return plenum, which, go, which is going to be quite warm. You're also getting heat gain, convective and conductive heat gain from the perimeter. So as you approach the exterior and the perimeter of the building where your heat gain is the highest, the temperature in the plenum actually rises. So we're, we're losing a lot of our cooling efficiency uh, as the air actually reaches the perimeter. So to improve upon that, we have the series plenum where we actually stub out some ductwork from those main duct drops from the air handler and we extend it a little bit further into the interior of the, of the building. And now the air flows from the, still from the interior to the exterior, but we're actually gaining a little bit less temperature uh, before we reach the perimeter because we've extended our ductwork a little bit further. Now to combat that heat loss at the perimeter, the reverse series plenum actually takes the duct and extends it almost all the way out to the perimeter zone. And now we've got the coolest, uh, air right at the perimeter, right where our heat load is the highest and right where our heat gain is going to be the highest. So we've now got the coolest air supplied right to the perimeter grill and now the plenum will gain some temperature as it moves backwards into the interior zone. But overall this is acceptable because we have our occupants where we're concerned about draft on the interior. So providing slightly warmer temperatures to the interior is, is far more tolerable than it would be to provide warmer temperatures at the perimeter. And then we move into the, uh, the basically the Cadillac design where we have an independent duct delivery. So this 
dotted line can be a physical or, or non-physical separation, but the main difference here is that we have basically a combination of the series and the independent or the uh, reverse series design where we have ductwork extended right to the perimeter and we also have ductwork uh, stubbed out to the central part of the interior zone. So now we have the most constant uh, temperature across the floor plate and we ensure that we get uh, even conditioning to the perimeter space as well as to the interior zones. And this can be helpful in a lot of buildings now which have a much higher equipment load if we're dealing with things like call centers, um, emergency call centers, things like that, where there's a lot of sensible load, a lot of um, computers and, and, uh, and equipment and that type of thing where the uh, interior load may be as high as it is at the perimeter. So that covers the actual plenum design, but there's one other thing that we can discuss on the actual plenum effects and the duct inlets to each the plenum outlet. So supply air, when it's injected into the plenum, can actually cling to the various surfaces in the plenum, whether they're firewalls or uh, plenum walls, things like that. And you can see that the flow is actually sticking to the wall and creating almost a whirlpool in the plenum. And you're seeing a, a, a quite a significant temperature difference between that diffuser on the far bottom right uh, at about 66 degrees to the top, uh, to the opposite corner where it's at about 59 degrees. So we're seeing a, a 6 to 7 degree temperature difference just in this plenum, which means we're not getting an even temperature distribution in this room and we may have uneven um, temperature conditions. And the fix is actually quite simple. It's just a matter of adding a single deflection bar or single deflection grill to each one of those duct outlets. And you can see it's now spreading the air across the plenum. And uh, we're getting a much e more even temperature distribution of within two to three degrees instead of the six to seven degrees we saw on the earlier slide. So a very simple fix, but makes a very significant difference to the actual distribution in the plenum. So next I'm going to start off with some of the actual applications for different um, perimeter supply systems. I'm going to start off by talking about some of the air-based systems and again we're going to kind of walk through a bit of an evolution of the process from um, the, the earlier uh, design criteria through to some of the more um, uh, cutting edge technologies like passive and active beams which can significantly cut down on energy usage. So the first system we'll talk about is using an underfloor terminal unit at the perimeter. This is a, a very simple system, very similar to an overhead system where we duct slot diffusers at the ceiling. But in this case, we have an underfloor terminal unit. It's installed somewhere in the interior floor plate. And we may or may not have a heater on there depending on the climate. And it's basically just ducted to a linear floor diffuser at the perimeter. So the main characteristics here are number one, the fan is always on for heating and or cooling. So we have an energy penalty because we use the fan no matter what. We can provide an ECM motor if, if you want to do some, some variable volume, but the fan is still has to be on at all times. Now this type of system is actually ideal when, uh, for one, when the plenum pressure is low at the perimeter to give you a bit of a boost. And it's also good for um, tall spaces or spaces where the perimeter load is actually very high. Uh, because we can cover a lot of space, we can provide a lot of air volume through the linear bar grill when it's being pushed by the fan terminal unit. And so behind that linear bar grill, we would have an underfloor booster fan terminal unit. And they can be provided again with ECM motors to, uh, to save some energy when, when in turn down. And a full line of accessories from hot water coils, electric coils, uh, SCR control, a uh, variety of different filters and attenuators for different performance and different sound characteristics as well. There's also a series underfloor terminal unit available which now introduces a return connection as well as a primary inlet. So it's more closely resembles a, a series overhead fan powered box. And now it has a primary inlet damper and cross flow sensor on that, on that primary inlet damper. So it is capable of providing mixed air temperatures. 
And the same line of accessories are available for this type of box as well. So at the end of that ductwork is going to be our constant volume floor grill and you see a picture of an example there. It's just a plenum which fits into the floor, the ducted connection, and the fan again provides all your control. So it ramps up or down to provide more or less cooling. What it also does here is one of the advantages is if you do have a lot of heat gain as you head towards the perimeter, we can locate the fan terminal closer to the building core to reduce that thermal decay or reduce the effects of that thermal decay. So just a comment on the actual application of linear bar grills. They are intended to condition skin loads. They have a, a much higher throw, much higher velocity, and much less induction than round floor diffusers. So we do recommend that they be kept to the perimeter space because they are going to climb at very high rates. They're going to have much higher velocity, which means they will be draftier and, and therefore unsuitable for interior zones. And as you can see from the picture here, and you'll see from several examples as we go through this presentation, they can be suited with a variety of different core and frame styles, different finishes to actually suit the architectural application. And so for selection of a linear floor grill, the, the selection criteria with designers is often looking at the actual airflow they need and then looking at the noise. But one of the considerations that should be taken, or something that should be taken into consideration is looking at the throw. Because if your throw is too high, as you can see in the very simplified picture on the left, that when the throw is too high, you start to mix that upper stratified zone. And now we, we lose air quality because we start to mix contaminants down but we also lose efficiency from all that heat that's stratified up at the top of, of the ceiling. So we want to make sure that our throw is about equal to the ceiling height or a little bit less so that we allow that plume to rise up to the ceiling level and basically shed its velocity by the time it gets there. Now in some cases that might not be possible. We're just limited by floor space, we're limited by grill size or airflow. But what we can now do is, is a, a field fix or even to be provided with the grills is to add diversion blades. And you can see from the two outputs here from the throw pattern that we can reduce the throw significantly and increase the spread. So we can get more coverage from a, from a grill by reducing the throw and um, varying the, the spread of the grill from anywhere from 3 feet to 8 feet, allowing us to uh, adjust coverage as well as uh, coverage horizontally and vertically. So the second system in the evolution of our uh, perimeter system supply is to not use the fan in cooling and now we provide a heat cool changeover diffuser. So the diffuser is both ducted to the fan terminal unit for heat but it's also open to the plenum. So there's a damper in the grill that actually modulates open and closed. And this is going to minimize the energy penalty for running the fan uh, in cooling. So the operation of the grill is, is fairly simple. You've got an actuator and the damper in there where the damper will modulate the cool plenum air coming from the raised floor plenum. And then once the system uh, goes into heating, then the damper would close off that plenum connection, open up the ducted connection, and now the fan will modulate and, and fire the reheat coil or the electric coil as required. A nice little case study again here, you can see the grills integrated along the perimeter uh, of the California ISO building, which is an energy utility in California. And you can see this is integrated with a very architectural space so we can fit within the constraints of a, of a highly architectural interior design and, um, and still be able to provide appropriate cooling for this type of space. So now I'm going to pass it over to Dennis Sikama who's going to discuss some of the water side options as well. Okay, thanks Ange. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue to discuss some of the developments and some of the other options on handling the perimeter products or the perimeter uh, systems. One of the more recent um, developments is called affectionately the trough heater. But basically what this is doing is the, the primary reason for the use of this is, number one, 
and it eliminates the need for a fan-powered terminal unit. That can reduce first costs, it can reduce operational costs, it can reduce complication on the system. And as Cam said, one of the ways we are doing that is by using uh, hydronics, and this particular one is, has VAV heating and cooling capability. Also, it allows uh, what we're seeing is uh, some of the projects are looking for long or continuous uh, grill installations that allows for that as well. And it can be more efficient our heat transfer. When Jerry talks a little bit about some of the chill beam opportunities, and if you've attended any of our chill beam webinars, you probably have heard about how transferring energy with hydronics or water versus air, there's a much more energy efficient method using the water typically. One of the first ones we'll look at is this trough heater. This is basically what has happened is the linear bar grill that Cam was just discussing, basically what's changed in this is that a fairly high density two row reheat coil is placed inside of it. And if you'll notice in the bottom there's a damper that pivots in the center and so basically what happens is this allows us to reheat and also have VAV cooling. And because of this density of the coil, uh, we have a fairly high output capacity of two to three MVH per lineal foot. And so an installation of this particular unit is here shown at this assurity building. This is an insurance company in the Midwest where we have, um, it's not a continuous run, but nearly so. But some of the issues or concerns that we saw previously with that trough heater is the fact that we are reheating mechanically cooled air that's coming out of the floor plenum. So based on that concern, then people have looked at other ways of eliminating the fan power terminal. And one is we're going to reheat or recirculate room air. And we do that with another trough type heater. And this one is completely sealed and is convective. It is inactive in the cooling mode. There's basically no airflow and it is purely convective so that that fin piece of fin tube radiation shown on the right hand side, the heater, heats up, cool air drops into it, heats up, rises up, and it handles our, cool, our heating load along the perimeter. We can't have continuous linear uh, appearance with this and it can be accomplished with fully active or some a combination of active or inactive sections. So how do we handle that in the space? Well, basically, this shows what a typical layout would be with the layout of the products and the control of it. And basically, there is a linear floor grill along the perimeter, the trough heater we just discussed, that's there only for the heating load. On the interior, there are the passive or the twist grills that Price uses, and those help maintain stratification across the floor plate. How? It's because that concern that Cam mentioned that if the linear bar grill is putting too much air out, we can have mixing in the space and it diminishes some of the capability of the stratification, which also can diminish energy, it can increase energy costs and diminish indoor air quality. So now if we want to be able to cool and to heat with this particular device, now this is the next step in the development. And so basically if we look at the bottom left diagram, with the damper closed, the inlet damper, this would operate very much like the trough heater we just saw. But that, and so it would operate once again very much like the other one in the heating mode where cool air comes in, heated by the fin tube radiation, convectively rises up. Now what we can do is turn that piece of fin tube radiation off, modulate the damper, and on the picture on the right hand side, it says open damper, it is a modulating, not to position damper, so we can modulate it to maintain comfort in the, when we have a cooling load by providing cool air along the perimeter. Once again, all of this is done without the need for a fan power terminal. So this is the Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts in Kansas City, and as you can see, this is a particular unit where this uh, trough heater was used that has capability of heating and cooling, and as you can see, it's fully integrated into the architecture there with the architectural features of suspension around the building. This is uh, put into the perimeter so it can be fully integrated with a continuous look. Another way, going just back a little bit, is that another way to do it with a fan-powered unit would be a subplenum method. This is used occasionally when people, what they'll do is they'll take a plenum divider as shown, They'll have a fan power terminal, and instead of ducting 
to individual devices, what they do is the plenum divider is there, separates off the, the perimeter uh, zone, and then we pressurize that. Often it's the um, fan power terminal has an ECM motor in it, so we can have VAV airflow. What that does for us is it gives us more flexibility within the space because we don't have ducted um, duct connections to the air diffusion devices, so it's easier to move them around. But one of the things we have to keep in mind is that that thermal latency or flywheel effect. Basically, if that fan power terminal is in the heating mode, that cement slab underneath the raised access floor will warm up, and if we want to head towards a cooling mode, it's going to take some time before we get all of that warm heat or that heat that's been stored up in the cement slab out. Another way we see, not as often, but occasionally there will be dedicated perimeter air handling equipment. This is, once again, for the perimeter zone only, similar to what we just saw with a fan power unit. But now this is done with a piece of perimeter equipment that's fed separately. And as you can imagine, the zoning and control of this particular device would be very important because if we looked at a colder climate, we may need heating on the northern side of a building in the middle of the day, whereas the southern side, we may, be cooled, we may, we may need cooling or no heating at all. If uh, you've seen some of our previous webinars on underfloor, you may recall that because of the temperature stratification typically seen in a raised access floor air distribution system, the return air temperature typically is in the upper 70s and then low to mid 80s. And so if we look at that and we have an open plenum ceiling system for the return, we will have warm air sitting up in that ceiling plenum. And to, to take advantage of it, a fan power terminal, similar to what we saw in some of the underfloor applications, but now this is up in the ceiling. And so, and also we, this would be in a traditional overhead system. We would have a fan power terminal that would run only in the heating season. And our first stage of heat could be taking that 80 to 85 degree air up in the ceiling plenum pushing it down through the linear slot to, if you will, wash the walls or windows with warm air to handle the heating load. Uh, if needed, depending on the location and climate, a reheat coil may be required and can be certainly integrated in the fan power terminal. And now I will turn it over to Jerry Sykes, who will talk to you about some of the beams and the hydronic applications, the most recent developments. Thank you, Dennis. We're, uh now talking about what more would be considered hybrid systems at this point, where traditional air conditioning heating systems are all air-based, and now due to efficiency gains, we're moving more toward a water and air combination. And what we're really talking about for efficiency gains really is related to the transport cost, or in other words, how much energy does it take to move the heat or cooling in and out of the building space. Water, being more energy dense, requires less break horsepower for any one particular given amount of energy transfer, and therefore it leads to efficiencies. Now, passive beams have uh, a very good effect for cooling because if you're placing this in a stratified room, such as under floor, either with a mixing diffuser or a displacement diffuser, you're placing the beam with a cold fin in the highest temperature air inside the space. And since, to satisfy the first law, we have to reject all the heat from the building to maintain temperature, this makes it a very efficient system. Now, where you place it can have an impact as well. You've got to remember that passive beams are gravity-driven. So, for those of you who know me, I'm somewhat bald. Dropping this over the top of my head might cause a draft sensation. That's one of the drawbacks to passive beams. However, since most of the heat gain is in the exterior part of the building space, placing this near the windows or exterior wall means that you can perhaps reject that heat gain from the exterior shell without it having mixed with the rest of the building space. Interestingly enough, I've had several buildings come in recently using a water rejection system such as this, a passive beam or a, uh, a sail, and using displacement under four systems come with energy savings compared to the base model at 90.1's 2004 release of 50 to 67%. Now, not everyone will ever be able to achieve that gain. That wasn't a very dry climate, but nevertheless, anything that we can do to cut our energy costs is something we should seriously consider 
And as the codes become tighter and tighter, we will all find ourselves doing that. Oh, okay, there we go. Sorry, lost the control for a second. The uh, passive beams often are mounted above the ceiling, and you can either take advantage of the plume of the window with either a soffit to capture that heat, but the real negative in this case is I cannot really effectively heat with a passive beam. So if I'm going to heat with water systems, I'm going to have to have either another system in the floor perhaps as a trough or a radiant heating panel, so this is going to lead to duplication. So oftentimes, instead of a passive beam combined with the exterior shell load gain, we use active beams instead. Since an active beam is an induction terminal unit, it uh, takes room air, draws it through a room coil through to energy exchange. So if you look at how a uh, passive beam works, you take air that's injected in a cavity with a row of nozzles. The row of nozzles takes the plenum pressure, drives it through that nozzle, expands, becomes velocity pressure, which creates a low pressure center over the plate, over the coil, leading room air to be drawn through the coil. Now, what really we're doing is we're transferring heat to the water system directly, or we're taking cooling effect from the water directly from the room air without transporting that air anywhere else whatsoever. We're doing it locally. And this is where we start seeing these efficiency gains that are very, very significant. If I look at how I judge the success or failure of a, a building for energy transfer, I, I want to talk about beams in terms of transfer efficiency. And what it really is is a gauge of how much of that energy I've transferred to the water versus the air system. And I'm always trying to drive to the highest numbers possible. So this leads me to the most efficient system and the least amount of brake horsepower required for cooling. Now, beam in cooling effect is somewhat limited because you don't want to run these beams below dew point unless you enjoy the nice sensation of rain inside your buildings, and most of us don't. So I would suggest that this leads us to the limitation of 2,100 BTUs per hour per square foot, or per lineal foot of beam. Now in heating, we can see larger gains than that because we're not limited by that temperature differential against the room due to dew point. The other thing that we often want to do with a beam is to uh, wash the exterior shell. We often do this with overhead systems. As Dennis mentioned in, uh, I believe, System 6, you were using the overhead uh, linear slot to do your exterior cooling effect or heating effect to uh, either minimize condensation or draft sensation or whatever you're looking to do. Well, nothing says you can't use a path, an active beam to do the same thing. Now, this drawing shows that you're taking centralized air, either heated or cooled, and using that to drive the engine of induction. It doesn't have to actually be that way. It could be a fan-powered box localized. Um, the air temperature in the beam that's used to do the induction does not have to be hot, cold, or neutral temperature. It's up to you in design philosophy where to take that air and how to transport it. But the net effect is that I have fairly decent throws. Um, linear beams actually behave very much like linear slots, so your throws can be up to 15 feet, easily allowing you to wash windows. Now, when we talk about an architectural aspect, of course, that leads to different systems. Another overhead beam that could be used is a soffit unit. In this case, it's going to draw the room air up through the bottom. In this case, it's showing a linear face, a linear bar face. And then it's going to inject the mixed plenum and room air that's been drawn through the cooling coil out a linear slot. This allows us to do areas such as atriums or large spaces with uh, uh, a nice, clean architectural impact. Now, the other, of course, approach is you can mount it in the floor. Now, this has been touted quite a little bit in literature lately. Um, you know, the net effect is I have one air system. The idea is that I'm not putting multiple systems in and so forth. Now, the interesting aspect of that, let's take a closer look at what a beam is. A beam, of course, as I described earlier, takes your pressurized air, through a nozzle, we exchange that pressure, static pressure, to velocity pressure, which drives the induction engine. And that drags the room air, either from above the floor or above the ceiling if the beam's mounted high, through the cooling coil and then back out, and can easily wash windows with this effect. The interesting thing is that without this induction ratio, 
If I were to only drive this with air from the floor plenum, I'm going to be cooling air that's been previously cooled, or in the case of heating, heating air that's been previously cooled. So this is going to take my efficiency of my system to a much lower level than it would be if you took it in this way, taking air from above the floor cavity that's already been, in essence, used to condition the space, and then we condition it locally. Again, remember, lowering your brake horsepower requirements because your transport cost is lower. And in this case, you can get a very high efficiency in 80 to 100, perhaps potentially uh, BTUs for any particular uh, GPM of water. Or, I'm sorry, CFM of primary air. Now, the drawback to this, though, is that beams typically run at about 0.2 to 1 inch of static pressure, give or minus, for the primary air supply. And that means that if you're under floor system, which is typically designed around 0.05 to 0.1, it's not going to have enough driving energy to actually get a lot of induction. So one solution is just like on the overhead system is you use a fan power terminal, perhaps, that takes the plenum air, which, of course, contains your fresh outside air mixture, and drives multiple beams because you don't need as much air to get this overall high efficiency as you would with the traditional systems. So this is something that's coming to its forefront. There is energy efficiency associated with it, but really you have to watch to make sure you're getting the most efficiency for your amount of energy you're expending. So you need to have a high induction ratio to obtain that. Now, let's say I just want to go ahead and cool my building, and I don't want to have to worry about a separate heating source from the floor or cooling source from the floor. I just use a radiant panel. It can be used in heating and cooling. There's an interesting side effect from this that actually gives you a, a bonus. Is oftentimes people will complain on the western side of a building about feeling heat sensation from the sunlight. Well, the only counter to that when I was working in human comfort was that you either blow more air velocity across a person's body to compensate for that warm sensation, or you use a radiant sink, or as we could say, a colder source panel, to offset the heat gain from the warm sun. And we've done this many different ways, and the net effect is that I can actually make this a very neutral temperature from a radiant point of view without expending a lot of extra brake horsepower to make this happen. Remember, if I put more air around a body, I'm actually going to disturb or destroy the stratification effect that may be present in that area. So, of course, now there's another side effect that's interesting too. Architects, well, the floor plan changes quite a little bit at times, either through customer demand or uh, interior layout design. And that means there may be a temptation to place objects clear up against the glass, like file cabinets or desks or other things. And if I have a trough system, that leads to an obstruction that's somewhat difficult to get air through often. And, you know, it's all about what the end user wants, of course, not necessarily what we need. Okay. So flexibility is enhanced using a radiant system. Um, you get to have a lot of benefit from it. But when we start talking about how all these systems actually combine, we have quite a few different options here. It's really up to you as a designer or as an owner or owner's rep to decide which is best for me. Every one of them has a different energy cost versus an installation cost. Now, you'll notice that we gave you general ballpark ranges of what we've seen for airflow rates with each of these systems. And as I tried to lead you to believe, the lower the amount of air I need per square foot will actually lead me to lower energy costs because I'm not moving as much primary air. And you can see clearly that the water system, the passive beams or rating panels or active beams, actually reduce your energy cost to the lowest point. Again, I have several buildings that have indicated significant energy savings when compared to an overhead mixing system or even, in fact, an underfloor mixing system. The only drawback is that I'm putting piping inside my building that may have not been present in the other design, and so there's some insulation cost components. Now, back and forth on this, it's all about the payback period. Calculating that requires knowledge about your building system, but the building I'm referring to uh, with the uh, passive cooling and the uh, displacement diffusers uh, achieved a three-and-a-half-year payback on the investment cost. So this is something that requires careful analysis, and we're more than willing to help with that. Now, in terms of design support, we feel that we have a lot to offer you. We have the largest offering on the market, the most complete system, controls, and other things, um, diffuser selections, aspects, customization, and so forth. And one of the best things that I can provide for you is application support engineering service, and also uh, provide you with the experience of understanding how it operates prior to actually doing your, your building. We have 
our research center up north in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is an excellent facility to go and view a physical mock-up or understand how the systems run. We have a uh, calibrated chamber that can measure extremely high accuracy, so we get the detailed information you need to have for your design. If you wish to experience it for yourself, come to our facility in Atlanta. We'll uh, step through the underfloor demo area and show you how it works. CFD, of course, is also used in this case. So sometimes we can take a physical visit to a structure like this where we can show how it runs, and we can also show you a visualization or a mock-up or CFD or a combination thereof. It's interesting sometimes the, uh, the real need is actually to explain to your end user how these systems operate and to give them a familiarity and comfort level, and we like to do that. It's fun. Well, Jerry, Dennis, and Pam, thank you very much for your uh, presentation today. And that does conclude the presentation portion of today's webinar. I'd like to go ahead and open the floor up for questions and answers. Um, you can go ahead and submit those using the, uh, the Q&A function or the chat function on your WebEx toolbar. And if you do use the chat function on your toolbar, make sure you direct those questions to all panelists, please. So I'll get started with uh, some of the questions that we've already received. Um, Gary, if you could kick us off, this first question is for you. Um, and it actually relates to the slide that you were just covering, comparing the different systems. Um, when someone's making a selection on an underfloor system, would they typically make their, select a system based on their energy and cost objectives, or are there building characteristics and limitations that would steer them towards one solution versus another? That's uh, a complicated question. In many ways, it really deals with comfort levels to a certain extent. I know the ultimate goal is energy savings, but you also have to understand that the end user needs to be familiar with their system as well. And then there's also, we've noticed, a geographic uh, difference based on where they're installed as to what type of systems prevail. And trough systems, for instance, you might find them in a colder climate rather than Atlanta. So some of it's geographic, some of it's user requirements or familiarity and and ultimately, all overshadowing, of course, is the energy code. Okay, thank you very much, Jerry. Um, Cam, the next question is for you. Could you please discuss with us how utilizing an underfloor air distribution system impacts the balancing for a building? Sure. Actually, balancing is uh, is significantly simplified because basically you have a, a pressurized reservoir, your your floor plenum. Each of those diffusers is constructed basically identically the same. So if you have a constant upstream pressure in your plenum, the flow rate is just going to scale based on floor pressure. So we have charts provided that basically give you a flow rate compared to uh, plenum pressure. And balancing is really as simple as ensuring even, uh, even floor pressurization and then scaling your floor pressure according to the airflow that you want. And if you have individual zones, you may need to provide a, a plenum separation or a divider if you want to get uh, different airflows, or you can provide different VAV outlets, which will be able to vary the amount of airflow coming. Thank you, Cam. Uh, Dennis, the next question is for you. Uh, what is the recommended floor-to-floor -floor height for an underfloor system? There's been a lot of research in that, and the, one of the things we want to keep in mind, as Ken said in the opening, this is a stratified system, meaning that the temperature rises from the floor to the ceiling. And what we'd like to see is a temperature rise that would give us something equivalent to a typical overhead system. According to ASHRAE and some of uh, you know, the ASHRAE comfort requirements, the, from head to foot, from ankle to ear, whatever you want to call it. Seated, it's about three and a half degrees. Standing, it's about five degrees. And in order to make that all work well, we should have a ceiling height at least of eight feet, nine to 10 preferable, what we typically see in an office building. Some of the research has looked at less than eight feet and said, well, maybe we can go less, but it diminishes the capability of underfloor because with underfloor, we are trying to condition only the occupied zone, zero to six feet up. And if we don't allow that stratification to occur effectively, we're diminishing that opportunity for reducing energy cost. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Jerry, I'd like to direct the next question to you. 
how can I maximize my system's efficiency using chilled water and a beam that's located in a raised access floor? Well, the, the easiest way to do this is to maximize your induction ratio. You know, the more room air you draw through the cooling coil means less air transport required from the central system. And since we're using the central system to drive it, uh, not transporting, that's going to lower your overall brake horsepower requirements and lead you to efficiency. I, I see beams anywhere between two CFM of induced air to a CFM of primary to as much as perhaps five, maybe six in extreme cases, depending upon the beam type. There's quite a few diversities. So just the goal, I guess, would be to maximize the induction ratio while minimizing your brake horsepower. In other words, leading to more heat transfer for any one particular given CFM of moving air. Thanks, Jerry. Cam, I'm going to throw the next one to you because I believe you, you touched on this point somewhat. Um, the question is, if I have an underfloor system with a delta T of plus or minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit from the air handling unit discharged to the underfloor, is this likely due to the heat from the slab? This is likely due to the heat from the slab. How do I correct this? Uh, difficult question to diagnose from a distance. Um, it could be heat from the slab. It could be, I mean, the potential fixes are going to be insulation, uh, looking at possible leakage and things like that. Um, and then actually looking at the plenum supply temperatures. So, um, I mean, in, in other troubleshooting applications, you can actually go in and instrument the, the floor plate look at the discharge temperature throughout the floor plate and maybe there's a block duct, maybe there's a piece of duct or part of duct work that needs to be insulated where it's not insulated, maybe there's some leakage and um, you're actually not just losing temperature but you're losing a significant amount of air volume somewhere. So um, that would be probably somewhere where we would want to be, uh, be involved in the conversation and, and try and talk through the possible uh, failure modes that, where it could have gone wrong. Thank you, Ken. Dennis, next one for you. How do you ensure the proper distribution of outside air? Well, like you have even in an overhead system, that can always be a challenge. The assumption is we're getting X percent of outside air through the you know, air handler, through the fresh air intake, and then the assumption is, is that as we split off into various directions and percentages, that that percentage of fresh air follows us. That's not always the case in an overhead or in an underfloor system. One of the things we can do to help ensure the fact we have a minimum ventilation within the space, for instance, is using a grill that has a minimum stop on it. One of the reasons people like to use the round twist grill that Price offers is it allows the person at the point of use to adjust the amount of air volume. So you get a certain amount of personal control, can offer a lead point, things like that. And when that face is adjusted to adjust the damper and consequently the airflow to the space, a stop can be put on there to ensure the fact we get a minimum amount of air into the space. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Jerry, next question for you. In high humidity areas, are there special design considerations for maintaining space comfort? Well, that's actually a valid question for any type of air distribution system. It may be perhaps more relevant to under four, if only for one reason. Um, most air conditioning systems, you have to start at the very beginning, is to how do I control humidity inside my building space? And when we design a, a raised access floor system, oftentimes this is a multi-tenant building, and you may not have the entire building occupied at any one particular given point of time. And if your entire system is not designed to handle that uh, partial loading for humidity control, I've seen several situations where you have the building, particularly with DX systems, running with a higher level of humidity than what's considered acceptable inside the space. So um, that's it. That's really all there is to that. Control your humidity and remember partial loading is important. Okay. Thank you, Derry. Dennis. Would you suggest that perimeter diffusers should have a directional angle towards the windows in order to wash the windows? Uh, that's a good question. Typically, as long as the diffuser is within 18 inches of the perimeter surface, windows, walls, whatever, 
we develop the Kalanda effect. It's the same thing that happens when we push air out of a ceiling diffuser. We create a low pressure zone, and that helps the air from the ceiling diffuser hug the ceiling, and that's how we can distribute cold air in a space without having drafts or unwanted dumping. Well, the same thing can, can occur when it comes out of the linear bar grill. It has a slightly higher velocity. That elevated velocity creates a low pressure zone and it literally draws the air along the wall. Now, if we're further than 18 inches, then we would certainly want to think about some sort of a deflection capability on the face of the linear bar grill to bring it over and create the quantum effect. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Jerry, next question for you. How do I get a cooling effect out of a passive beam when it passes across a warm surface? Well, I'm going to make this assumption that we're talking about a warm window or other thing. You have to remember the cooling effect is is all driven by heat removal. So if I have a colder airstream against a warmer surface, I'm going to take that heat out with that air system. It's, it's a very straightforward heat change. Okay. Thank you. And uh, next question, I'm not sure who to direct it to. Maybe Cam, actually. Cam, what is an acceptable leakage in a raised floor through panel seams along the wall, etc.? Um, well, I can refer to our, our engineer's handbook, which uh, which we've come out with in the last year or so, and um, a lot of research by the Center for the Built Environment, which where they looked at the two different categories of leakage, and I think most of the guidelines have said that less than 10% of leakage should be uh, should be acceptable, or 10% maximum leakage should be acceptable, and, and there's always two types of leakage. There's leakage through the floor, which... Um, I mean, you can you can take uh, you can make uh, attempts to control that, but there's always going to be a certain amount of leakage through the floor tiles, through the panels, that type of thing. And then your other category of leakage is the actual leakage through the building structure, so through door frames and and walls and and uncontrolled leakage. And um, uh, the combination of those two, I believe, is is recommended to be less than 10% because. Uh, otherwise, you're really getting way too much uncontrolled leakage because all of that leakage is, is really uncontrolled by your um, VAV system or by your temperature control system. If I just may add to that, Cam, that Absolutely. I believe it was ASHRAE Journal in December 2010 had an excellent article on the blower door test that's used to check the integrity of the floor plenum and the floor tiles. Uh, also, if you go to the raised floor access, raised access floor manufacturers, they have some good information on that as well. And I'd like to point out that you have to remember the two different categories. One is worse than the other. Any airflow that goes through the floor tiles, as long as it at least tries to be uniform, is actually going to condition the space. It's the energy that's lost through the walls and other leaks that are actually causing the biggest concern when we talk about leakage in my mind. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Dennis, oh, actually, if I could just jump in for a moment. Uh, we're, we're coming to the end of the list of questions that we have, so if you do have an additional question, I suggest you go ahead and send it now. Um, Dennis, next question I'm going to send in your direction. With the passive heating trough, um, there is no filtration and in-floor is a bad location for dust and lint. How much of a problem is it to keep the thin tube clean? Well, one of the things, if you recall, when we were talking about the different trough systems, the very first one I talked about actually had air coming up from the bottom, which people are concerned about as well. Uh, that has a fairly dense coil. The other ones, the ones that actually use room air, the coil fin spacing is fairly wide, so the potential for lint and dust to collect on there, number one, is fairly low. Secondly, the velocities are not extremely high, so there may be some of the lint and dust that would fall down into the trough but would not come back out. Uh, also, that if there is a concern about cleaning it, typically there is a little clip that holds the linear bar grill down into the um, trough plenum or sometimes it's just resting on a shelf in there so it's easily removed and can be vacuumed out if there's any maintenance or cleaning required. And, you know, if dirt is a concern, we also find the recommendation of every six months to a year, you check all underfloor diffusers for dirt buildup. You should do it at the same time. Especially in your higher traffic areas, because that dirt smudging comes from 
within the space, often from carpet fibers. Thank you very much, Dennis. And I'm going to direct the, the final question that we have time for today to you as well. Um, if it is needed, how would you suggest thermally insulating the slab between floors? Well, one of the things I have seen, in, have seen an engineering firm do is they just take duct liner, two foot wide, because the typical support post spacing in a raised access floor system is two foot on two foot. And they would literally roll duct liner out in between the uh, support posts for the underfloor raised access floor system and lay that on the concrete floor to create a thermal plenum or thermal break between the higher or the higher temperature cement slab and the cooler air in the raised access floor plenum. Also, one of the things we didn't get into, but what another thing people do is typically the supply duct, if it's uh, sheet metal, it's not insulated because the supply temperature is higher than we normally see. And what people will do is literally raise the supply duct off from let do not they, basically they don't let it lay on the concrete slab. They raise it up so that there is an insulation air insulation barrier. And that can be done with something as simple as a piece of scrap steel stud. Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, again, Cam, Jerry, Dennis, I'd like to thank you for your presentation today.